Okay, I think go. we're ready to go. Okay, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get this meeting started. Um, as we begin, I know we're doing a hybrid format. Can everyone hear me okay on the, the digital format? Thumbs up. Some, I, see, I see a nodding head and a thumbs up. Great. Um, so we'll do the best we can. Staff here has done a great job of uh, really helping make this work. Um, so we'll we'll try it out and, and you know ask for your patience in advance um, as we as we work through this together. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. I think uh, we'll do a attendance roll call. Okay. Um, so we'll start with labor. I know Matt is excused for today. Um, Jill? I do not see Jill here yet. Marcy will be here joining in a few minutes, and we have Scott and, and Margaret. I'm here. And we also did our, te our, our inverted test thing. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Thank you. I believe Tammy is excused for today. And Sarah, hi. John? Okay. And Lynn is here in person in the, in the hearing room, in the room. And Patrick is here in the room as well. And Andrew is also here in the meeting room. I and I see Marcy. Yes. I got you now, Marcy. Hello. Okay. So we have we do have quorum. Okay, great. Um, so we have a, a few kind of hybrid meeting ground rules as well um, that we can go over to, to start to prep everybody on this. Um, to start out, definitely, uh, you'll probably hear this a couple times, but if you're not actively speaking, please do have yourself on mute. Um, we get uh, quite an echo often if you don't. Um, Teresa, do you want to go over any ground, any other ground um, rules? Yes. Um, so this is the really, literally the trial run um, for myself in doing a hybrid meeting, also for MLAC as well, of course. Um, so we, I, we have that. I put together kind of like a set of working rules um, that which we will adjust our sales, so to speak, after um, this meeting. Um, and so, in some time in the nearest future, hopefully by our next meeting, we will have something that we can put on the MLAC website. Also, give out to. Um, people who are speaking at future MLAC meetings on this. Um, but most of it is really um, similar to what we did in when we were in a virtual setting. Um, really, the big change is just making sure on my end and our, the staff here that uh, we provide equal access um, to and participation in the meeting for both those here in the, in the actual hearing meeting room and those that are participating virtually. Likewise, um, the ability for um, stakeholders to participate either in the, hearing, in the, in the meeting room or virtually as well. Um, so there's that. Um, we tried our best to make sure that with the current the cameras that we have available and technology resources that we can see each other equally. There, again, this we, we may have to adjust some things, but please be patient with us as we work out through our, our bumps in this. And I've, not just for MLAC, but probably other DCBS meetings as well, because we're all basically have the same sets of equipment there on that. Um, Going back to the access and such, um, my role is in helping the presiding co-chair in making sure that people in the room, um, members have ab ability to ask questions to those in the meeting room and also in the virtual room. Likewise, making sure that members participating virtually have the same ability to ask questions as well on that. Um, we won't be taking meeting attendance. Um, there, there is methods for us to do such via Zoom and in the, in the meeting room. So, but we, so we're not going to ask at every meeting for every participant to be, say their name in the interest of time. Um, but I will also facilitate that as well um, make, if, in regards to stakeholders that could answer questions as appropriate on that. Um, all votes that are be taken during the hearing that are not unanimous, what we'll do is we will be done by roll call votes. Again, that's the same as we've done always on that. Um, unless a member asks a specific question to a meeting attendee or, or the presiding co-chair is taking public testimony, the virtual meeting audio, the ability for, for people to speak, is limited to members only and myself. Um, no non-member attendees' audio should remain muted, and I do have the ability to mute if need be on that. So there's that. Um, also, the chat feature, we, we have that running throughout the meeting. Um, it is to be used only for sharing meeting materials, um, announcing meeting breaks, like if, if we have to go into caucus or if there's a technology glitch, anything of that nature to announce when we're coming back in or when we're in recess, um, things of that nature. And it is considered public record. So that also includes any direct messages that you send to any other participant in the Zoom meeting on that. Um, 
if we are recessed again, we will place, we will do what we did before. We will announce the, re, you know, that, the, that you're, the members are in caucus, an estimated time that we will reconvene. And uh, members, when that time comes, we will provide you with instructions on how to participate in the Zoom caucus room um, atmosphere. When the meeting is adjourned, we will end the electronic meeting by turning off, closing the remote meeting software. So it will, the virtual portion um, area of the meeting will adjourn about the exact same time as when we adjourn here physically. Um, and if there's any technical questions or you have issues that arise during the meeting, um, my uh, contact information is in chat. You can also send me a direct message there. Um, if there happens to be a technical glitch with Zoom and we can't connect for some reason, um, we may pause the meeting, but it is up to the co-chair's discretion to continue the meeting in the physical setting. And, that, and if there's the glitch that occurs, that will be reflected in the official meeting minutes on that. So again, this is a trial run. Hope everything goes well. Um, and we will adjust. And if you, again, if you do have questions or like ideas, um, feedback on, on your end, please feel free to reach out to me post-meeting on that as well. That's all I've got there. Great. Yeah, and, and for those folks who are uh, attending virtually, if you can make sure to use the raise hand function uh, if you are interested in, in providing testimony or being called on, um, and then making sure to unraise your hand as well or put your hand down is always helpful um, as we have the panel of, of folks in front of us on, on the screen here. Um, so I think uh, first order of business we have is the uh, review minutes from the April 14th meeting. I'll move them. Okay. So we have uh, movement to accept, to accept the minutes. To yeah. accept the minutes. <clears throat> Do we have a second? I can second. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we have those accepted. Um, next on the list, I'm seeing department updates, uh, starting with WCD rulemaking. Uh, we actually do not have any forthcoming rulemaking meetings. I will mention um, a prior stakeholder meeting during the legislation update portion of it. So if you get a couple minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you will. Uh, right. Let's see, members. So the second item is a report, is the Senate Bill 533 MCO report on come along providers. This is a statutory requirement from the 2013 session legislation. Um, provide the, um, so the um, DCBS uh, must report to MLOC every year um, in regards to uh, Recommend let's see, so uh, it's, let's see, I apologize. Um, it's a report about all denied what's called a come along provider request on that. And so the memo in front of you uh, briefly explains what the criteria is in the, um, that has to be in the report. Um, and it, it, so in calendar year 2021, no MCOs denied or terminate providers that were subject to the reporting requirement. If you are interested in prior reports, um, we, okay. Okay, we'll have Sally talk. If you have, but I'll mention, I'll finish my sentence. I apologize. If uh, you, have, if you're interested in prior reports, um, I believe some are on our website. Others we do have available. Just you know, reach out to me, and we'll send them to you right away. And then Sally would like to do speak to that. Sorry, Sally. No problem, Teresa. Thank you. Good afternoon, co-chairs and committee members. Sally Cohen, administrator for the Conservation Unit, and appreciate. Uh, Teresa teeing this up for us uh, today. This is the annual report on the managed care organization uh, denials of worker come along report. So as Teresa said, this is in reference to the May 2nd uh, memo that you uh, have before you. Um, as you heard at your uh, last meeting, an injured worker may bring their own provider along when they are enrolled in an MCO. Certain conditions are met. So a come along provider is defined as a primary care physician, chiropractic physician, or an authorized nurse practitioner who is not an MCO panel provider, and who becomes authorized to treat the worker when they are enrolled in a managed care organization. So to qualify as uh, come along providers, that provider must maintain the worker's medical records, have a documented history of treating the worker prior to the injury, uh, the provider must agree to comply with the rules, terms, and conditions regarding services performed by the MCO, 
and the provider also must agree to refer the worker to an MCO panel provider for specialized treatment, including physical therapy. If an MCO denies the worker's come along request or it terminates the provider status at any point, that decision can be appealed through the MCO's dispute resolution process. The MCO decision is ultimately reviewable um, by the worker's compensation decision. So the report uh, before you today, as Teresa noted, comes from a, le a legislation that was enacted in 2013. And the uh, bill in 2013 was based on MLAC's recommendations for changes uh, to nurse practitioner authority. It also expanded what types of providers qualify for this come long process. Prior to that time, an MCO could not deny a worker's choice to bring their non panel provider into the MCO. So to monitor the impact of that new law, uh, the bill required DCBS to provide MLAC an annual report about all denied come along provider requests. And since the bill took effect January 1st, 2014, there have been only a few denials or terminations each year. We looked back at our data. Um, it averages about 3.8 providers per year and impacts an average of 4.3 workers per year. So um, as you see on the report for calendar year 2014, uh, all four MCOs operating in Oregon provided their report as required by rule, and none of the MCOs denied or terminated providers subject to this reporting requirement. This is the first time we've had a report of zero denial. Um, our MRT manager, Robert Anderson, is also logged on today, so uh, we are happy to address any uh, technical questions the committee members may have. Do we have any questions in the room that I'm seeing? No? Uh, do we have any questions online? <clears throat> I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, I, I guess I, maybe uh, I have a quick question. I know that in, in my experience, um, anecdotal such as it is, um, there was a, a provider that I was seeing that was, when I was enrolled in MCO, that provider was not in network such as it is um, under that MCO, but they were at another location under that same MCO. Um, and then there was a different MCO that I switched to that uh, that provider was in network at that same location that I'd been seeing them. It, it seems to me that that might be a, a bit of a data black hole that we have that even if there are, they're not being denied as it come along, that there are other ways that folks are, are kind of resolving the issue of, of not being able to, to see who they want, where they want. Um, is there any way that, that we might have data on that, uh, such as, you know, MCO and the number of folks that switch MCOs once enrolled or, or anything like that? Or is that, I know that that's kind of a, a difficult scenario to capture uh, data on. I'm not entirely positive about that. Uh, Rob, do you know, do we capture any of that data? We would have data if a dispute came before us, but just in general, I'm not sure that we do capture that data. Yeah, I, I really don't think that we have that fine of detail. Um, it, it may be something that we could get through the NCOs, but I don't know that even it would have that. It sounded like it was a GSA possible question, you know, it, if you were moving from one um, a provider in one location to a different location, because it, typically if a provider is uh, a member of that MCO, it doesn't matter where they're providing the services, it's, it's that provider is, is part of that MCO. So um, I don't know, it, I, I don't think we have that kind of detail currently, though. Okay. We can flag that, so it's got to as Rob mentioned, something we may talk to the MCOs about to see if they're able to provide that level of detail. Yeah, I, I know, and again, this was several years ago when I went through the process, but I know that there was a, uh, a sort of absolute right to change or object to an enrollment in MCO uh, within a certain time, initial time period. I think it was 30 days or something like that. Um, it, I'd be interested to see the number of, of folks that are enrolled and then switch sort of within that, you know, that, that avail themselves of that right. I don't know if that 
data has been tracked or, or if that would be easy to get or, or something that's maybe not tracked by the division, but um, uh, you know, that MCOs have information on or something, it might, might be something interesting there. Right. Yeah. Something we could we can definitely talk to the MCOs about that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this is Ann Klein. Um, oh, I have to go. Yeah, used to the used to the virtual. I know it's okay. You raised We're, your hand. That's you all you had to do. You raised your hand. We're all learning, Ann. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, Ann Klein, president of Majora Cell Systems, one of the MCOs, and the reason I raised my hand is because when it comes to the question about switching from one MCO to the other. Um, the MCO would probably not be the most appropriate data source for that because we don't necessarily know why somebody is being disenrolled. Um, and so that, would, that would be what we would see, a disenrollment, but there's different reasons why that might have been triggered. Um, so more likely it would be um, the, the insurer, the carrier, that you would want to go to for that data. Um, I can also briefly speak to your other question, which was about a provider at two separate locations and one was on panel and one was not. And while I can't say exactly, mm -hmm. I can give you the most common scenario. Um, it's certainly more frequent in the Portland metro area and Salem, metro, um, Salem area, where there might be a couple clinics and a provider um, works at both or is an employee at both or maybe mm -hmm. contracts at one and then has their own clinic and one holds a contract with the MCO and that entity and then the other does not. So that would be the most gotcha. common scenario. Um, although, of course, there's always various snowflake reasons for why something doesn't go the way it ought to, but that would be um, my best estimation. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So any other questions or, or discussions on that, that issue from folks? Uh, Patrick? Uh, so you, you commented that this is the first report with no instances? And so is that, is it, you know, a fluke? Is it a, a continuing, you know, an improving trend? Uh, and is uh, this evidence of the efficiencies or effectiveness of MCOs? Thank you, Patrick, for the question. I, it's a good one. My guess is it's a fluke um, because our numbers have remained very steady over the years just with a couple, couple three at each year. Um, but we're not entirely certain. Thank you. Any other questions about this? I'm taking a long time on this. I know sometimes it takes folks a minute to process and raise their hand digitally, so. So I think moving on, I know we have an update on, on legislation implementation. Yes. Uh, so to, to provide um, an update, um, so the five bills that MLAC had rec has recommended um, for to be enacted have all been signed by the governor. Um, I wanted to highlight two um, bills in which have been recent activities. Um, I will do the first, and then I'll turn it over to Jennifer Flood for um, Senate Bill 1585. Um, House Bill 4138, which is what we've called, you know, summarized very highly, high level, is the time loss bill. Um, had a um, WCD had a stakeholder committee meeting on May 3rd um, to talk about issues, get some information clarified um, to help the division in shaping uh, potential uh, rules um, to start the rulemaking process. So this is not a, a this was not a rulemaking advisory committee. It was like a precursor, if you will. It's quite the easiest way to describe it. Um, the audio and uh, the minutes um, are available on the under the rules and um, hearings page of the division's website. I also need to correct myself back to the WCD rulemaking. Um, there actually is not any forthcoming hearings, but there is a rule in which they, um, the division is still taking uh, public testimony until the 20, May 24th. Um, what this rule proposes to do is replacing gender-specific net pronouns in 24 rules that are overse overseen by the division. There is no, no hearing on this, but again, there, public testimony is welcomed and it is available until the 24th. Apologies for that. And so um, the other bill I think that's of interest to the committee is Senate Bill 1585. This was the bill that directed um, Oregon Health Authority and DCBS to enter into a data sharing agreement in regards to that. Um, Jennifer Flood has been heavily involved in that. Um, so is she here? 
Oh, over there. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> I, I knew you were here somewhere. <laughs> I, know she's, I know you've got some great updates on what's going on there. Oh, thanks, Teresa. Uh, Jennifer Flood, I'm with for Oregon Workers. I'm part of DCBS. And I had the privilege of working through the process of 1585, Senate Bill 1585. We did, I don't know where to look. You, it's, you, you're, you're, you're just fine. Just look straight ahead. Yep. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> um, we did perfect a data sharing agreement with OHA. They were able to filter down their data, so we did not have to do an agreement with the employment department. From OHA's uh, list of 178 COVID deaths related to workplace outbreaks, they reported 55 that were actually employees. The other 123 were associated with the workplace outbreak, but not actually employees. Um, in reviewing that data, uh, we found that four claims had previously been filed with the department, so I did not send letters out to those estates, but we sent out 51 letters on May 1st to the estate of these workers that have, been, that have died um, with COVID. Um, since that time, those went out on May 2nd, May 1st or 2nd, whichever was that Monday. <laughs> and um, to date, we have received eight calls from those families um, inquiring about their rights in the process of filing workers' compensation claims. That's what I got. Any questions on that? Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> And then I have one other item that's not on the agenda. It's just an update on executive appointments. Sure. Um, so the next round of executive appointments, which we believe will include MLAC members, um, this will be new appointments and um, reappointments, um, will happen in mid-September on that. I know a number of stakeholders have information about that and the deadlines. If you, are, if you would like that information, feel, please feel free to reach out to me and I can send some information to you. Or if you have questions about the vetting process. Um, on, on positions with the governor's executive appointments office. Great. So do we have any questions or comments online or in the room before we move on to the next topic? I, I would like to make one comment and it's just uh, since Lynn McNamara is here and your and your term is, is ending and this is after six years of serving on, on seven years. Mm -hmm. Seven years serving on the committee. I don't know if you'll continue until, until September. I don't know how that all works. It, it's up to Lynn. <laughs> Actually, well, I, can't, I can't make the next meeting. I have a conflict, but I should be able to be there the rest of the time. Oh, you'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, you can hold it. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> but just to, I'll recognize her now and again. Is just for her leadership and, and helping us as new people, you know, uh, transitioning. And so I know she must have been an excellent. For us, really yeah, and I would just say a big thanks to you in helping in shaping what you know my, what I've been calling MLAC 2.0, yeah. in guiding this and guiding the you know the, by, the bylaws and, and reminding us of the importance and, re, and, and the revisions to make you know our, our current system shine as much as it has over the past. Yeah, I know. Working with you as well on that and and going, we're not through COVID yet, but yeah. going through the, the the hopefully the worst of it. Um, together and then kind of coming back together and, and as Teresa said, building MLAC 2.0, I think it's, you know, we really appreciate the work you've done with that. Thank you. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's, and it's been an education. So. Great. So I think uh, next we have uh, COVID-19 claim updates. And starting with the denied COVID-19 claim update for uh, Sally Cohen with uh, WCD. Thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, good afternoon again, committee members. Uh, Sally Cohen, Administrator of the Workers' Compensation Division. And um, we're going to tag team on this today, my colleague Matt West, West and I, so I'll take the first part. Um, I'll give you an update on the division's uh, second audit of our uh, denied COVID claims. Um, audit. And you did receive a copy of the written report by email last week, so this is the May 9th uh, summary, audit summary report. And since many of uh, the committee members are new to the committee, uh, we would like to also provide just a little bit of background about uh, why we did this audit. So in uh, 
2020 and 2021, MLAC spent time reviewing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Oregon workers' compensation system. And part of the committee's review included examining the requirements for processing claims. The division has had administrative rules in place for quite some time requiring an insurer or self-insured employer to conduct a reasonable investigation of the claim before issuing a denial of the claim. And as part of the MLAC review, uh, the committee made several recommendations, and that was including a request to the division to adopt additional administrative rules uh, requiring insurers to conduct reasonable claim investigations specifically for processing COVID-19 claims uh, before a denial could be issued. So as, as a result of uh, that recommendation, in October of 2020, we did adopt temporary rules to implement uh, the MLAC recommendations, and we later adopted uh, permanent rules that were substantially similar to those uh, temporary rules. Permanent rules uh, we adopted in February of 2021. So the, uh, the uh, rules adopted in October of 2020 and February 2021, these outline steps an insurer or self-insured employer must take for a reasonable claim investigation before denying COVID-19 claims. Uh, the steps include uh, some very specific uh, actions, including investigation of likely exposure that arose out of and in the course of the worker's employment, the investigation, an investigation of the source of the worker's exposure, and the specifics on obtaining a medical opinion in certain circumstances, determining whether the worker did not work for a period of quarantine or isolation, and determining whether medical services were required. Rules also require the division to audit uh, deny COVID-19 claims in relation to the reasonable investigation standard. We did complete a first uh, denied claim audit in February of 2021. And that first audit primarily, primarily looked at reasonable claim investigation of denied COVID-19 claims that were filed on or before October 1 of 2020, which is when the temporary rule went into place. And that audit was uh, conducted under the more general uh, prior reasonable claim investigation standards that had already existed in the administrative rules. So this second audit that we just completed focused on insurer and self-insured employer application of the new uh, reasonable investigation rules that are specifically for COVID-19 claim denial. WCD's statutory authority uh, limits of what we can audit. And so we have authority only to audit the reasonableness of the insurer or self-insured employer's investigation of a claim and not their decision to accept or deny a claim. We cannot evaluate the correctness or appropriateness of the compensability decision. And that is under the jurisdiction of the Workers' Compensation Board and not the division. Also, just like with our other uh, performance-based audits, we do not audit every single claim. Uh, instead, we collect a sample of claims reported to the division. In this uh, case, with this audit, all denied claims for insurers and self-insured employers who had um, reported five or more accepted or denied COVID-19 claims were audited in this sample. For the second denied claim audit, uh, the sample size started with 377 denied claims uh, that were processed by 12 entities, covering 13 insurance companies and seven self-insured employers. You'll see on the uh, May 9th a summary report, uh, page five, table one, shows the companies and the number of claims we reviewed for each company. And uh, these companies have been notified of our audit findings, and this summary has just now been posted uh, to our website as well, so it is uh, public now. Our auditors uh, reviewed the records for the claims at the insurer or the self-insured employer's location or at the service company if uh, one was used by the insurer or self-insured employer. In our audit, we found that reasonable investigations according to the rules were conducted in all claims that we reviewed. No violations were found, and we did not issue any civil penalties. The auditors noted additional items that were outside of the audit's objective but are of interest uh, related to COVID-19 claim processing. And um, the auditors' notes about their findings start on page six of the summary report. 
Um, just a quick summary of some of the additional findings of interest. Um, about 89% of workers were tested for COVID-19 and about 58% of them tested positive. Most of the sample claims were filed for either an exposure to or actual COVID-19 infection. And in about a quarter of the audit claims, workers did not respond to contact attempts by the claims processors. About 60% of the claims that we audited showed that the workers had lost wages from work. Uh, temporary disability was due in 15% of those claims and was paid in all but three claims. Also, some insurers, uh, even though the claim, they ended up ultimately denying the claim, they did pay medical bills for testing or exams required to authorize tests. Auditors also made uh, some observations that are included in the summary report about some of the differences between the uh, first nine claim audit that we conducted and the second one that we just recently uh, completed. Comparing the early 2021 audit and this most recent audit, auditors found um, that a, a higher share of workers were tested for COVID. Um, about 80% of auditors were, uh, workers were tested in the first audit and 89% in the second audit. This is likely because uh, testing has become more available. Also, a higher percent uh, of workers tested positive. Uh, in the first audit, only about 26% of the workers were tested positive, and in the second audit, 58% uh, of uh, workers tested positive. This uh, second audit also had a higher share of workers filing claims specifically for infection. Um, in the first audit, it, that number was only about 17%. And the second audit is 48 percent and fewer uh, workers uh, were filing claims for exposure in the first audit about that number was about 81 percent second audit was a little more than half to one percent we also noted uh, regarding temporary disability there was a similar share of workers who lost wages from work um, but a higher share of the workers was uh, who were paid temporary disability when in fact it was not uh, legally required to be paid. In the first audit, uh, that was about 9%, but a um, little more than a third, 33% in the second audit. I would be happy to address any specific questions you have about this, uh, about our um, audits and our findings, too. I see Lynn. Uh, Sally, uh, you may have said this and I spaced it, were the entities, the companies uh, audited the first and the second time different? Uh, we actually added a couple of additional companies the second time, Lynn, but the vast majority of them were the same entities. There were a couple uh, additional companies who were subject the second time. Okay, thank you. We used the, we used the same uh, criteria with the five or more uh, claims re reported. There were a few more companies that got folded in the second time. Not seeing any other questions in the room. Do we have any folks? I see a hand uh, up. Uh, and, and for the folks digitally and, and in the room as well for having mercy on, on the folks that have to take minutes for this, if you could announce your name before your comment as well. So I see V. Sabo. Dr. Vern Sabo speak. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, go ahead. Please uh, say your name again. Thanks. Yeah, Dr. Vern Sabo, I had a, a question for Sally. Did you document or note the type of COVID test that was performed? Uh, Dr. Sabo, we did not, no. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions online? Not seeing anyone else. Um, so I know you said you had a, a sort of second part that uh, Deputy Administrator Matt West was going to jump in on. Yes, thank oh. you. Uh, yeah, Matt will uh, address uh, some additional information about the COVID uh, claims that have been reported to the division. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, committee members. I'm uh, Matt West. I'm the deputy administrator here at the Workers' Compensation Division, and I'm here to give an update on uh, reported COVID claims uh, that have been reported to this division. Early in the pandemic, uh, the division was asked to post regular updates on our website uh, about reported COVID claims, and we continue to do so. Uh, if you go to our website, each uh, every week we post a spreadsheet um, with all of the, the COVID claims that have been reported up to, to that time. And then each month we post a, a, a separate report. It's the one that MLAC staff should have provided you. Um, and that report is uh, a high level summary by industry and by insurer type. Um, so that's, that one's updated monthly. So the May 2nd monthly report uh, that you have, that's the data that I'm gonna summarize today. But before I go through the data, there's a couple of important caveats that I'd like to point out. Uh, the division, we receive reports of many workers' compensation claims, but not all claims. Um, we don't get accepted non-disabling claims reported to us, which are uh, met, well, claims where only medical services are provided. And then we also don't get City of Portland fire and police disability and retirement claims. Uh, they have a separate system. It's also important to remember that insurers have 60 days to process a claim and then uh, an additional 14 days from the date that they make their decision to report the claim to the division. Um, so our data is always going to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a lag um, for that processing and reporting time. Uh, the report that we um, sent to you uh, were for claims reported as of the beginning of, of May of 2022. The first section of the report uh, shows the reported claims by insurer. And then the second part shows those same claims by industry, broken down by industry. And then the third part uh, shows the reported COVID claims by insurer and industry. And there's, there's three tables in that portion of the report. Um, one shows uh, safe processed claims um, by industry. And then the next table shows um, all private insurer claims by industry. And then uh, the last table shows all self-insured employers claims by industry. Um, so the data on the report is um, an ongoing tally since the beginning of the pandemic. The earliest reported COVID-19 claim uh, in Oregon was for a date of injury of February 20th of 2020. Um, and then just a high level summary of some of this data. Uh, as of May 2nd, there have been 6,588 reported COVID-19 claims. Um, those are accepted disabling claims and then all the denied claims are reported to us. Of the claims reported, about a third, 37%, are uh, claims filed for exposure to COVID-19. And then two-thirds, about 62%, are for their COVID-19 disease claims. And on the monthly report, it's broken down by exposure claims and, and disease claims, so you can see the numbers um, on that. And then less than 1% um, are fatality claims. Of all the claims reported, 72% uh, uh, were safe claims, about 13.7% uh, claims were pro uh, processed by private insurers, and then 14.3% uh, by self-insured employers. Probably not surprisingly, uh, the largest share of reported claims are from workers in um, hospitals, uh, nursing, assisted living facilities, um, and other types of healthcare settings, followed by uh, public safety and state agencies, like corrections, um, public safety officers, etc. And then there's something to point out, kind of interesting, there are quite a few claims under the support activities for forestry. Um, and we, looking into the data a little bit more, uh, that was due to, during the 2020 wildfire season, um, there were outbreak, COVID outbreaks in the, some of the firefighting camps. So that, that's why there's a higher number of claims in that um, industry. We're also often asked for an overall acceptance rate for COVID claims, with, um, as I mentioned, because we don't get reports of all claims. Um, we don't get the accepted non-disabling claims. We can't calculate an, an overall acceptance rate. Um, but what we can do and we have done is uh, calculated an acceptance rate for, for just the disabling claims. Um, and so I have that. So for disabling claims, because we get both accepted and denied disabling claims. So for disabling claims, the acceptance rate uh, for exposure only claims is 82%. And then the acceptance rate for COVID-19 disease claims is 88%. And there's a 52% acceptance rate for uh, fatality claims. 
And then another thing that we've been asked to track kind of from the beginning, and it's a manual process, so I don't have numbers uh, at this moment, but uh, we've been asked to track the, the most common denial reasons. Uh, so the top uh, most common denial reasons that we're seeing, the first one is that the injury or exposure is not compens compensably related to the worker's employment. The next most common denial reason is that the condition did not arise of and in the arise out of and in the course and scope of employment. And then the third uh, most common denial reason is that the worker tested negative for COVID. And at your last uh, MLAC meeting, a member asked about appealed denied COVID claims. So um, something to, to remember also is that a worker has 60 days to appeal a denied claim, so there could be um, a lag in, in some of this. But as of early May, uh, there were 1,374 denied uh, COVID-19 claims, both accepted and, and non-disabling, or me, both disabling and non-disabling denials. I apologize for that. Um, about 58% of those that were denied uh, were exposure claims, 40% uh, denied were uh, disease claims, and 2% of those denials were uh, fatality claims. So of those 1,374 denied claims, to date there have been 80 um, denied or partially denied claims um, that have been appealed to the Workers' Compensation Board, so 80 total appeals. Of those 80, um, 65 of them are fully denied claims, um, and four of those 65 were denied uh, fatality claims. There were also 14 partially, partially accepted claims that have been appealed, and then one denied aggravation claim that was appealed uh, also. So that's the, uh, the data that I have uh, right now, but thank you for your time. I'm available for if you have any questions about the report or any of the numbers I went over. Uh, yeah, so I see Lynn. Yeah, um, it's really not a question for you, Matt. I just want to make a pitch for the for DCBS, especially as your technology improves, to get those accepted non disabling claims. When we were trying to deal with the COVID issues last year, it was frustrating to all of us that we didn't have the full picture. Right. I mean, yeah. They're claims. Yes, and we share your <laughs> they frustration. They may not be disabled yes. claims, but they're claims, and they need to be counted. We just didn't have a, a sense of what the whole universe was of claims. Right. And, and we did, just as a just a quick update on that, we did have, there was a bill that passed in 2021 to allow us to start requesting those, um, those claims. It doesn't go into effect until next July of 2023, um, that, that we would be able to, to request them, but our, currently our system isn't, um, we don't have a system to receive yeah. them. Yeah. So as part of our modernization, a pitch for our modernization program, and we appreciate your support for that, we'd be able to, um, you know, have, the plan is when we go to claims EDI to, to be able to receive all claims, because you're right, um, it's hard to, you know. Because yeah, you know, the insurers and the, the self-insurers, they have a system, so sure. you can get them. Yeah. Just, yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. I have one question as well. Patrick? Do you have any, any perspective on how Oregon's experience relates to other states? Do you all monitor that at all? Um, well, I, we, I know our policy team was tracking uh, sort of what other states were doing as far as presumptions and other things, but I don't know that, that we have any data on how our numbers compare to others, but it's something that we can look at getting. Just, I don't, I, it's not scientific at all, but I went to a, a National League of Cities conference last week. I sat at a, at a round table where we talked about COVID, and these are self-insured public safety, the number one, the number two category. And, and what I know of the Oregon claims is they were far less than the other states that were there. And, and we, the discussion was about vaccination levels and, and uh, reactions just to employers. I thought it was very interesting. I thought it would be interesting. New York? We were one of the top states with the lowest function population. Uh, that would be a piece overall. Yeah. Thank you. I'm um, Dave Walker. Conversation, small business office, its office. And to the question about um, other states' experience with COVID, um, the National Council on Compensation Insurance says 
a very robust website that captures a lot of data about COVID. And so I, it might be a good place to explore um, the data that you might be seeing. I think uh, to your point, Patrick, a, a comparison even of um, other uh, metro areas might be interesting too, or selecting out some specific metropolitan areas. I know we've used that as a comparison sometimes of, of picking an area of a similar size and similar population density um, because you can get such variation with states where maybe, you know, a, a rural area will pick up a lot of, absorb a lot of claims, or a more modern or urban area will, will have tons of claims, whereas more rural area wouldn't, or depending on the population density. So I think that might be interesting as well to see some of that data of pick a couple metro areas or a couple rural areas and, and see what your um, you know county level data or something would break down to as well. Any other questions in here? I see we have a couple hands online, so I'll go. I see Keith Semple first. Um, I noticed that um, some of the third party um, claim processors aren't on the list. Um, I've got um, claims for deceased workers uh, with Corbell and Intermountain. And, uh, and I was wondering, are there certain uh, third party claim processors not on the list? And are there certain uh, self-insured employers that aren't on the list? It seems like there's a lot more. So is there a cutoff for the size of um, self-insured employers that are reporting and, and being counted here? So on the on the monthly report, if, if that's the one you're referring to, it's broken down by insurer and it should be, and self-insured employer, it should, it should include all of them. It's not broken down by third-party administrators. So, um, you know, a Corbell claim would fall under whoever they're processing that claim for in the list for, for either the self-insured employer or insurer that they're processing that claim for. But it should be, unless it's a, a lag, you know, unless it's been reported or hasn't been filed and or reported in the last, there's a potential 74 day lag. So it could be that it's, um, that it hasn't been captured yet or, um, or we can talk offline if there's a specific claim that you're not seeing on there and I can look up to make sure that, you know, we do a lot of manual data entry into our system so I can double check to make sure that it was entered correctly into our system so there could be the potential that a data entry error is making it so it doesn't appear on the report. Is there a cutoff for the size of self-insured employers that are listed? Because it seems like there'd be a lot more in the whole state of Oregon. There's not. So if there's any insurer or self-insured employer, even if they only have one claim, um, will, is, should be on the list. Thank you. And you said 74 day lag? Potentially, or this, so there's 60 days for the insurer to process, and so if they took the entire 60 day, made a decision on the 60th day, then they have 14 days to report to us, and then, you know, if they sent it on the 14th day, and then just, you know, kind of behind the scenes of how, then it comes into us on paper, um, and then we have a team of claims coders that, that manually data enter every claim. So again, plug for our modernization <laughs> program. <laughs> Yeah. So there is some, you know, so there could also be a delay in just getting the data entered into the system. Gotcha. And for just additional information, we've made the COVID claims a priority claim. So when they come in, those are some of the first claims that get entered just so that we have, so we can have the most up to date uh, data as possible. Okay. I see, I believe, Dr. Sabo again online. Yes, I just uh, wanted to make a quick comment regarding testing. Uh, there's a variety of tests, and they're not all uh, created equal as far as accuracy, and I would think that would be something that all the stakeholders would be interested in relative to claims. Um, you have the rapid antigen test, serology test for antibodies or T cells. I want to hear a lot about is the polymerase chain reaction test or object known as the PCR test, and uh, evidence shows that um, if the cycles of what are known as cycles of amplification are 35 or above, the test is essentially use useless in that it's picking up simply strands of nucleic acid, meaning you have almost a 100% positive rate. 
if it's not, uh, if it's at that high of amplification. So I would think that that's something that uh, the division would want to, or someone would want to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I see next we have a small business ombuds overview. We have two folks come to join us.
representatives of insurance companies, we have a small business owner, and we have a representative of a public entity. Um, in this committee, we review National Council on Compensation Insurance Filings, better known as the NCCI, I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, and uh, the NCCI is our state's workers' compensation rating organization. Um, at these meetings, we also um, use this as a forum to hear employers who may have a dispute with their workers' compensation insurer with regards to their assigned classification and or experience modification. And uh, our office works with our appellants uh, so that we can ensure that they get a fair hearing. These meetings happen quarterly. So our really real uh, meat and potatoes are calls, are our calls and inquiries, uh, whether it be by phone or email or text nowadays. Um, and or we, of course, when we're doing outreach, uh, Sometimes we just get people walking by our booth and, and say, hey, can you help me with my workers' compensation insurance issue? Um, so we take pride in the fact that we respond to our inquiries within um, virtually 100% of the time within 24 hours. Um, about 5% of our contacts are outside of our niche of workers' compensation insurance, and we do our best to uh, keep apprised of other resources that are available to, uh, to the business community. Um, we do a lot of collaboration with Boley, um, with the Construction Contractors Board, um, Secretary of State's office, and um, they've been very helpful with our constituents when we refer them over there. Um, so the most common questions we get in our office are, um, well, first of all, do I need to buy workers' compensation insurance? You know, first and foremost, and it seems like a simple question. Uh, generally speaking, if you have an employee, you need workers' compensation insurance. Um, but there are a number of exceptions, and we help our constituents navigate through those exceptions, whether they qualify or not. Um, once we establish that uh, they need workers' comp, the next question, of course, is, well, I've never bought workers' compensation insurance before. How do I get it? And so it can be a complicated process, but we um, educate them about what the process is and how to make sure they get the, uh, the best quote they can possibly get. Um, a more uh, complex question that comes up is, how do I appeal my workers' compensation premium audit? So each workers' compensation policy is issued using a projection of payroll. Um, these policies run for 12 months, generally speaking, and at the end of the year, the insurance company um, audits the policy to make sure that the payroll that was projected was in line with what, the act, what they actually incurred during that policy year. So, for example, if they reduced their staff or increased their staff, it's likely their workers' compensation premium is going to change due to that audit. So. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts with this. There's definition of payroll. There's the assigned classification. The use of independent contractors. And um, insurance companies and uh, employers don't, that's my phone, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, don't, um, don't always agree on the facts of the case. And so each uh, final premium audit bill comes with the opportunity for the employer to appeal their audit as long as they do it within 60 days. And they contact um, our uh, Department of Financial Regulations in order to get that process going. Um, so we uh, do a lot of hand holding when we get questions uh, related to this and help them through that process. Um, and here's, uh, I'll share one of my examples of that. Um, we had a nonprofit contact our our office. Uh, they were um, basically a storefront that provided materials, recycled materials, for um, people like school teachers and parents that wanted um, material that they wanted to do uh, maybe a, an art project or a school project with, um, with their, their child.
child or their student. And um, the workers' comp insurer came in and did an audit and felt that the, um, the operation was actually more of a recycling operation than it was a, a retail store. Um, if you can imagine what a recycling operation can, can include, you know, like gathering, you know, curbside bottles and recycling them, uh, plastic and newspaper and things of that nature. And this was just basically a storefront where people could come in, donate items, um, such as toilet paper rolls uh, or carpet squares or things of that nature for art projects. And so the nonprofit contacted our office said they were unfairly assigned a high-rated classification because their premium was going to uh, triple as a result. And uh, we worked with the employer. We um, actually visited the location, uh, did an inspe our own inspection, worked with the insurance company and with the NCCI to get the classification reassigned. And they were, we were able to get the original classification Sign once we were able to educate them of exactly what this business did for a living. Um, so that was uh, one of our more positive results. Um, and I think um, Kevin wanted to share. Yeah. Um, so one of the also the more complex calls that we get are um, regarding non complying employer penalties. So um, a non complying employer would be any employer that has subject workers but did not have workers' compensa compensation. Um, and so they can get penalized based on not having that. Um, and a lot of goes into that, but you know, the time frame in which they didn't have workers' comp, if there was a claim, you know, any, anything that goes along with that. Um, so we got a call back in 2019 from an RV dealership who was being penalized about $60,000 for um, not having workers' comp for, I believe, about a two year period. Um, and uh, they obviously called us because they're panicking. Uh, you know, $60,000 is a lot of money for anyone. Um, and so we were able to kind of work with them, get the um, ins and outs of the whole problem, and then we contacted our employer compliance unit and asked them to pull the file. Um, obviously, when we get an NCE, not always is there something we can find, but if we're going to find it, we try. Um, so we were able to look at the cal uh, calculation that they utilized in order to assess the penalty. Um, and realized that they had, again, kind of like day story, used the wrong classification code. They used a much higher classification code of um, a uh, pretty much a RV mechanics shop, which is a lot different than like a dealership where they you know, sell the vehicles. Um, so the classification code was a lot lower. Um, and uh, you know, normally with an NCE penalty, there is an opportunity to get the penalty reduced without calling us. There's a whole process that they can go through um, where it goes from uh, two, two times the estimated premium to 1.05 times the estimated premium. So in this instance, because the classification code was also incorrect, we were able to not only get that penalty reduced to the 1.05 or times the premium, but we also get it, got it reduced um, to the lower classification. So their bill went from $60,000 to $7,000, which is um, you know a pretty big deal when it comes to a small business. Um, so uh, yeah, that was one of our more fun ones. It took a lot, but we got That was there. a very long process. That was a very long process. <laughs> yeah, and uh, non complying employer uh, investigations for us, it, Generally, we're the last resort for, for these employers to see if they get any relief. Um, uh, so um, it's generally a very panicky call. Very so panicky. I <laughs> prefer them all to Caitlin. Yeah, uh, every time. <laughs> so with that, um, we'll entertain any questions that you may have. I'll ask one question. Yes, so Patrick. small business, you know, are, are strapped and working hard. And you said workers' comp is not the first thing they think of, or even the first surprise they have to have it. Um, one of our objectives for MLAC is to look at simplification. Is there anything that you have found from talking to these businesses that would improve, make it more simple or easier for them? Um, well, I think that uh, you know, our, there's a, there, I think there's a lot of fintech going on right now with. Um, uh, employers able to get quotes online, um, and I know insurers work hard to make that a, a simpler process. Um, workers 
compensation is just a very, very complicated product with so many moving parts. And uh, uh, not only from the claims is complicated enough, but uh, you know the employer side is also very, very complicated. So um, I'll have to give that some thought. Um, but I know that from a FinTech standpoint, that insurers are uh, they're all competing for business, and they just want to make it as simple as possible for employers to get their product. Um, to add to that, there are some resources for smaller businesses, especially ones that are just starting. Um, if you if people go to the Secretary of State's Small Business Assistance Team, they have like a pretty much a list of all the things that um, new employers need to kind of make sure that they do. And workers' compensation is listed on there. Um, so, uh, I mean, hopefully that helps trigger the, at least the idea of workers' comp meeting to happen, and I believe our information is also added there. Um, and like Dave said at the beginning, we partner very close with them to make sure that if, you know, a small business calls them, then they also try to call us. Um, so, we try to get the message out as much as we can <laughs> to make sure that people know they at least need it or could possibly need it. Do we have any questions from folks online? I think a question that I have um, thinking about this, I'm not as familiar with small business, I did work at a small business legal clinic for a little bit, so I have some ideas. Um, but curious, do you, a lot of, I know on the workplace safety being prioritized for many businesses, especially in, in the industry that I work in construction, um, do you guys provide any kind of safety training resources or anything? I know a lot of insurers have their own kind of in-house uh, industrial hygienists and stuff that, that do training. Some, some contractor groups and other things have that. Um, do you have access to some of those resources or can at least put small businesses in touch with those folks? Um, or is there anything that we could do to help kind of facilitate that by chance? Um, yeah, we're certainly open to that. Um, our office doesn't specifically address other than to encourage it <laughs> um, and to you know, certainly contact um, our OSHA uh, consultative arm mm -hmm. and then also insurers, um, some of the insurers have uh, very robust uh, loss control um, safety departments. One more opportunity for any questions folks may have. Not seeing anything. Well, thank okay. you so much. Yeah, that was thank great. You. Thank you. So I see next we have uh, ombuds for Oregon workers overview. changed our name to Ombuds Office for Oregon Workers. Um, the office was actually, or the position, was established in 1987 um, through a legislative bill that was um, pushed through through um, organized labor um, to provide resources to workers um, to help them navigate the workers' compensation system, um, understand their rights, and to advocate and resolve complaints at the lowest level possible um, without having to go through litigation when it wasn't necessarily necessary. Um, this past October, uh, DCBS Director Andrew and the Governor expanded our services to include serving um, workers who have questions and concerns regarding their rights and responsibilities, um, protections within the, the uh, workplace safety and health system, Oregon OSHA. Um, and as ombuds, I'm also uh, engaged in activities to help identify how we can break down the cultural and language differences that can often impose barriers to workers in need of that protection. As I mentioned, our office is part of DCBS. However, we're purposely separated from the Workers' Compensation Division, Oregon OSHA. Um, my position, I'm appointed by the director um, in concurrence with the governor, and I report directly to the director and the deputy um, 
that DCBS. I forgot to say, you can ask questions as we go along. <laughs> um, I do have a team of five assistant ombudsmen. They do the ombuds, sorry. Uh, they do the heavy lifting of our office. Two of them are fluent in Spanish. Um, we have an incoming um, phone line that folks can choose English or Spanish. We do provide services to all languages. We just need to use a language link to um, provide those services. My team handles approximately 600 inquiries a month from injured workers, and it takes about 1,200 contacts to actually resolve the concerns that are coming in. 20% of our calls are non-English. Um, most of those, I would say 98, 99% is Spanish, but like I said, we do provide services in other languages as well. 84% of the time, we're able to help workers understand or answer their questions just by giving them information. The other 16%, um, we provide assistance in advocacy by either contacting the insurer, um, working through some issues, sending them um, different forms on how to file claims, um, et cetera, or providing them the resources for obtaining um, legal counsel um, if necessary. 77% of our inquiries that come in we resolve that same day, whereas 86% are actually resolved within a two-day period. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, some of the common issues that come in on the workers' comp side of things, besides just the general basic inquiries, is information regarding medical services, whether that be the availability of the services, hey, I was enrolled in an MCO, what do I do now, delays in treatment, delays in um, authorizations, um, or in the case where a claim is actually denied, dealing with who's liable for the payment of the services that are still pending out there. Um, another common area is filing claims. Um, we go through that process of explaining subject employers, subject workers, um, the process of filing claims, um, and help them through that process. Um, I forgot to mention, we are not attorneys. We cannot provide legal advice. Um, so we can't represent the workers, but we do what we can in advocating and helping them navigate the system. Accurate and timely benefits is a big one. Hey, I was injured, you know, three days ago. What am I going to do for, for um, money or income? And we go through the process of explaining how benefits are calculated for time loss or wage replacement, as well as what a timely payment would look like. Um, when there are issues about the timely payment, like, hey, I was injured three weeks ago and I haven't heard from anyone, then my team's going to go through that process of tracking down employer, insurer, what information is needed. Um, many times it might be that the claim never got filed with the insurer or the insurer didn't have um, adequate information to calculate wages. Um, whatever it is, we try to plug those gaps and to ensure that the processors have what they need to process. Sometimes things do slip through the cracks, so sometimes we get the, oh my gosh, that hasn't gone out, it'll go out today. So um, we can share that with the worker and um, keep them all rolling on, on those. Litigation is a, another um, big piece of our daily activity. Uh, when a worker receives a claim denial, mm -hmm. um, I've had some difficult ones this week. Um, okay. Sorry. Litigation is a big deal. Denials, we always encourage legal representation and, uh, and explain the process to those workers going through that process. We also try to find the resources for them to bridge the gap that is created when a claim is denied. And I apologize. <laughs> I have feelings this would happen. Um, when a claim is denied, so they, so at least they know, okay, where can I go? What, what services are out there? What um, benefits may, might I be eligible for outside the workers' compensation system? What if I, um, you know, try to to enact my short-term disability? What impact is that going to have on my workers' compensation benefits? We don't have all the answers, but we do what we can to connect these workers with the folks that can help them. 
it's not, um, our office is not the place where it's like, hey, that's not what we do, go find somebody else. We really do try to find all these resources for the workers so they can um, uh, provide for their families and move on. Our little thing is, hey, let's make tomorrow better than today and um, see what we can do. The litigation process um, can be very lengthy. Um, we don't want to give workers false hope regarding what that's going to look like. Sometimes folks might think, oh, it's just easy. Oh, you just have to appeal that and then a hearing will get scheduled. Well, the reality is if they have rent or mortgage that needs to be paid in two weeks, um, many people, hopefully you're not surprised to hear this, many people live paycheck to paycheck. So any kind of hiccup in that is pretty, um, devast can be really devastating to them. Okay, I'm back on track. Um, the other issue is concerns related to their employer. Return to work restrictions. Hey, I can go back to work, but my employer won't offer me any modified um, work. That is an example where the employer doesn't have to offer modified work, but boy, we've got some tricks in the trade through the um, programs at uh, WCD with the Employer and Injury Program. Um, and if it's just a not being aware of what benefit or what programs are out there to assist with safely returning a worker um, during that interim um, for transitional work, modified work. Um, we try to get the employer on board, get the preferred worker program or employer injury program involved to help move things forward. Um, most workers don't want to sit at home and collect time lost. They want to get back into the, the workforce and um, be able to provide for their, for, for their families. Um, another thing is the whole concept of, you know, yesterday I was a hero, today I'm a zero and those feelings that come into play when a worker's been injured on the job and um, separated from their work life. So we work through those things and like I said, I'm, I'm a real uh, proponent of the uh, employer injury program and preferred worker because I believe it's a win-win for both workers and employers. Um, okay, any questions on that? Uh, just a quick one, Jennifer, yes. if I may. Uh, has the, I'm sorry, sorry. I was going to say, Lynn, just okay. for the yeah. minutes again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, with remote work being so prevalent, uh, did that change employers' ability to provide uh, modified work? Yeah. For those workers that have the blessing of being able to work yeah, remotely. Right, which I know is um, It really, we have not seen any hiccups with that because it's modified work for the employer. They're not having to have higher claims costs and the yeah. worker is able to still provide um, services, yeah. receive the paychecks yeah. and whatnot. But, I'm um, thinking about like EAIP uh, provided equipment. If somebody's oh. in a, you know, thinking about equipment to help someone do their job yeah, more effectively, and, and if they're remote, how does that come into play? You know, that, sorry if I'm getting too. No, far no, here. that's 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 really good because that's a really good question for Matt West. <laughs> 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 I don't know if if, if WCD has data regarding um, modifications done in the remote setting or not. Yeah, but just Matt, would you like to? And we don't need to take a lot of time on that. I'm just curious. That's okay. Yeah, come on. The more people that can have ideas on how to help workers get into transitional work, the better. Yes. The short answer, I don't know that we have any data related to that, but I do know that um, you know, early in the pandemic, with the preferred worker program and employer injury program, we encouraged you know, outside the box thinking and um, for workers, we, we instructed our um, worksite modification consultants when they're meeting with employers to brainstorm and let them know we could help provide modifications for in-home use and so but I don't have any data on how, how many yeah. times we've done that yeah. but, but it is something did, that is available. I guess that was the fundamental yes. question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we always like to have EIP and preferred worker in the pocket to, to help us <laughs> be able to make tomorrow better. Um, any other questions regarding the types of questions and concerns that we get from workers? I have one question as well as yeah, Patrick. I heard you, and this, I'm Patrick Freed. Yeah. And, and uh, that 20% of the calls are Spanish speakers, and it just struck me that that seems like a higher percentage than it would be of the workforce. I don't know if that's true. 
sure. Oh, I don't, I don't know the percentage of the overall workforce, but with um, the manual labor and the issues that are involved, plus I have a really, um, my two um, bilingual staff are, um, have built quite a rapport and trust with a lot of the vulnerable communities where they feel, um, they feel open to calling us because they, they built that um, rapport uh, which gets passed along to other crew members and whatnot. So um, I think that that's probably a, a piece of it. Um, and it's just the, the physical nature of the type of work that a lot of uh, non-English speaking, Spanish speaking folks in the agricultural community um, are performing. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not seeing any questions okay. or hands online. <laughs> so I'll just move to some of our other activities. Um, one of the things that our office does, my chief assistant, um, Jaylee Lad mosgrove handles all the unrepresented claims disposition agreements. So if a worker is going through a CDA, claims disposition, claims disposition agreement, um, and they do not have an attorney representing them, the Workers' Compensation Board um, has asked our office for the last 20 plus years to contact these workers during the 30-day pool that they have to ensure that they understand um, the settlement itself, what they're giving up, and what they will retain. We do not get involved in the money um, negotiation portion of that. Um, with that being said, if something is really wonky, um, I'm going to call and I'm sure. $50, really? Is, there, is the decimal off? <laughs> so there, there are times where, where that might happen. But um, again, we do encourage uh, legal representation. Um, these folks have, most of them have decided not to go down that road of having um, a legal representative. They're buying off, that's my term, I, I kind of talk in straight talk. They're buying off their accepted claim for X amount of dollars. Um, many of them think they're going to get out of the system that way. We get to explain that, well, medical is still part of your claim, which some, that's a really good thing. Um, if it's a global settlement where there's a disputed claim settlement in involved, sometimes that door is pretty well, pretty shut. And so we go through that to make sure that they understand, hey, yeah, you're getting, you know, $10,000 on your CDA. Um, but you also have this DCS that does is a current condition <coughs> denial because sometimes they think that they're going to continue to receive all the medical services that they were receiving before. So um, we go through the process of just explaining what benefits it appears that they're giving up, what they will be keeping, and encourage them also to um, speak with an attorney if, if they have questions and concerns about that. In 2021, um, Jay Lee handled 522 CDAs <coughs> that represented over $11,700,000 in settlement, doc, in settlement um, proceeds to the worker. Um, again, our, our role isn't to encourage or discourage these types of settlements, it is to ensure that the worker understands. The reason this, came, this process came into play years ago is because workers would go through the CDAs when they first came in, um, and then three, four years later say, well, I didn't, I didn't understand it. And so the board wants to have that extra layer of another um, outside person um, explaining to them what that document is. Scott? Oh, yeah, Lynn. Thank you. Um, again, I might have missed this. How do you know that there is a CDA out there? Um, one, uh, some of the insurers will refer a worker to us. Okay. They have, the insurers have a responsibility of explaining to an unrepresented worker what their document is. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the, the larger insurer really encourages those workers to contact our office ahead of time mm -hmm. before those documents are actually even drawn up so they have another person talking. But then once a CPA gets filed at the board, Okay. If that worker is not represented, the board informs us, and then we we go through a formal process of you know sending out letters saying it's really important you call us, and then we communicate back to the board through our system mm -hmm. that we have talked and 
either the worker agrees or they want an addendum or they uh, want to pull out the CDA and we've talked through that process with the worker because it's a, they have to do that in writing. Um, typically, I'm not saying that the board will not sign CDA <laughs> without our contact, but if they don't see in their system that we've had contact, then we communicate back and forth as to what's going on with that. So, I'm going to try this one, okay. <laughs> um, another role that I have is to facilitate um, fatalities um, when they come up, Oregon, OSHA, or the media, or whatever, if I'm aware of an accident that has taken place that appears to be work-related, um, then uh, OSHA receives a report of it, I get notified by them, and I go through the process of determining who the insurer is. My, our, our goal in doing this part of the communication um, was basically established back in 2007-2008 when MLAC did a study on death benefits and having a grieving family being contacted by 15 different entities trying to get this workers' comp process rolling along can be really um, devastating. So um, kind of facilitate that communication I do a, what I call a courtesy call out to the insurance company that insures the employer to ensure that they're aware of the accident. That does not make it the claim, but it gets the ball rolling um, as to you know what they're going to do with it in case they haven't been made aware of it. And then Oregon OSHA, they're required to send out a next of kin letter when they've received a report of a fatality. And in that letter, they include my contact information. Um, I go through the process also if the insurance company or if a funeral home contacts me, um, getting the information regarding if the claim is accepted, what these benefits are. Families are having to make these decisions within four to five days as to how it is that they're going to um, uh, handle the, the uh, care of their loved one. And the fact that these benefits are not paid until a claim is actually accepted, is important for them to understand um, that, you know, hey, workers' comp's gonna pay, you know, 23,000 on a burial. Well, that's only if it's accepted. So um, part of that is educating funeral homes regarding that, um, that benefit and um, making sure that the family is aware of there's, there could be some liability there if a claim is not accepted in, the, in those cases. Um, communication, family, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now I'm going to do a plug. Kids Chance of Oregon, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Um, it's not part of our agency, but it is very related to the work that, that we all do. Um, I was on the board, I was actually on the founding board back in 2013. We started, it's a scholarship um, nonprofit, um, and all scholarships are based on donations. Um, as I said, I was on the founding board as well as past co-chairs of AMLAC were, were on the board as well. And um, since 2014, that scholarship fund has given scholarships to 18 students um, and more than $286,000 of scholarships that was all based on donations. These children get the scholarships if their parent had been killed on the job, an accepted fatality, or um, uh, awarded permanent total disability. So I'm just throwing that out there. There's also the Workers Memorial Scholarship that's part of our statute and is administered through um, Oregon OSHA. They also provide scholarships to um, the same uh, group of children. We also do funding, or it's not funding, I don't do funding. <laughs> we do outreach <laughs> and training. Um, any, like I said, I can chat forever, but um, anything Workers Comp 101, Ombud Services, um, training to organize labor, insurance companies sometimes will have me come in and talk about what our services, how we can, um, our role between us and the insurance company and whatnot, but anything um, you ever uh, want, you can, that doesn't sound right, um, you can call me, I can't, I can't provide everything, but I'll try to figure out how, or who. It says next page, oh, we're, oh my gosh, sorry Andrew. Workplace safety and health. <laughs> the, other, the newer component of, of our office. Um, we actually publicized a news release went out in January 
and um, since that time we really haven't received very many um, inquiries from directly from workers um, but we're working to get our contact information out there to ensure that folks know that we exist the few calls that we have received they were related to COVID and the Oregon OSHA complaint process which we worked through but in addition to that, um, I've been participating, and so has my staff, in the underserved, underrepresented community outreach, as well as Oregon OSHA stakeholder meetings. The heat and smoke rules have been a very big deal. Yes, they got done last week, um, a very good thing. And then working with immigrant and seasonal workers, some of the activities around that with ag labor housing, retaliation, and um, transportation in those situations are pretty big issues for that, those communities. I do have our new ombuds flyers on the back table if you want some of them, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Give a sec for folks to process. I know we're coming to a close. I just want to thank you for your office help, invaluable in helping me with my claim, and, and it wasn't even a, a really an issue more than just a communication hang up between myself and the insurer, the processor. Um, and it was extremely helpful to have a place to go to. Quick phone call, somebody picked up right away while I'm laying on the couch, unable to move or go anywhere or do anything um, to get that resolved, to get that process moving. So Great. you, the work you do is invaluable, really, you. You in your office. Know. Yes, definitely. Like I said, they're the ones that do all the heavy lifting. And that was, I think, 2017. Still sticks with me. So okay. that, that oh, important. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we do have some workers that have been around for like 30 years that we saw. <laughs> <laughs> so I think any, any questions, any, did you have a, maybe a quick anecdote or anything? I know we had some, some great examples of uh, um, things from, from the small business um, ombuds of, of, you know, work that you, you had done. Um, something that sticks out. I put you right on the spot right at the end here. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm putting my... My protective shield. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, let me think of something that won't get me too emotional. Um, really, the work that we do on a daily basis, making sure um, time loss checks are accurate, going through that process um, with the workers and insurance companies, um, ensuring that checks get out, you know, uh, is an important thing. But um, uh, a lot of our work is listening and trying, like I said, trying to help make tomorrow a little bit better, um, whether that's within our system or not. Uh, within our system, okay, whoo -ho. <laughs> within our system, um, I'm really sorry. No, my, no. My mind's you're, you're passionate about the work and committed to it. Please do not apologize. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I actually can add something. I don't know the details of it, but I remember a few years ago, you came to my office and we were talking about, you were asking me you know, to, uh, Kind of uh, do a gut check of problem solving. Um, you, you had a you had a, ca a case in which the worker was I don't know if it was temporarily homeless or oh, yeah. but yes they yes. did yes and uh, you had asked if it was thought it was a good idea to use our the agency address as a place for their benefits to mm. to be sent. Yes. I mean it's that level of uh, creativity and thinking and problem solving. It's just it's amazing. I I I, I marvel at you and your team every day oh, what you do. Thank you. Yeah. That uh, with the homeless community, um, and many of them are employed and uh, receiving benefits, but um, the whole, whole, I don't have a bank, how do I cash my check, um, all of that is unfortunately very common in, in the office in trying to be creative in a way of uh, getting people um, the benefits that they're entitled to. And I will say in that regards, a lot of the adjusters out there struggle with that as well and they will call and say i don't know what else i can do because legally they just need to send it to the last known address but um they also know that that's not working in some of those situations so thanks okay. yeah so any any questions in here any any virtual questions i haven't seen any hands raised i didn't mean to scare you with my emotions no. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I thank think that you. was very insightful. Yeah, thanks. So I think that's all that we have scheduled. Um, were there any other kind of comments or questions, closing remarks from anyone? Anybody online? 
No. So I think we can uh, adjourn at this point. We so can. thank you, everyone, for your patience and, and for all everyone who presented today and, and commented. And uh, hopefully we will uh, continue to perfect this hybrid format. Thank you. Yep.